Thank you very much, Tim. Before the uh, official timekeeper starts the clock, I want to just say a few things by way of um, getting the preliminaries out of the way. As Tim mentioned, I have been here many times. I think the exact count is 13 now. I was privileged to live here on campus back in the summer of 2000 when I had been awarded the McGlung Chair of Thomistic Studies to teach at the Notre Dame Graduate School of Christendom College. And living here gave me an appreciation for what a unique and singular blessing all of you have shared. And I hope none of you ever get to the point where you take it for granted. This is one of the largest slices of heaven on the planet. And uh, I have a very, very special place in my heart for Dr. Warren Carroll, the founder, and uh, his widow, and the, uh, the other people who were part of this, uh, Dr. Burns, who's now running the graduate school in Alexandria, and Dr. Bill Marshner, who I think is here tonight. We've had conversations over the years, and uh, there is also another very extraordinary and peculiar blessing you won't find anywhere else. <laughs> and I, uh, I count it a, a great blessing to be friends with him, but also Eric Janislawski and the people in this department. But after visiting this place now for almost a quarter of a century, it really is a singular privilege for me to be here and thank our Lord and our Lady and all of the, the patron saints of this place. And what you're learning here is what the world is dying for. And so I urge you to uh, study hard, pray hard, and take all that you gain from this place out to the world. Let's begin in a word of prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, our Father in heaven, we thank you for the gift of your eternal Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And in his name, we pray for you to pour out the Holy Spirit upon us this evening, to illuminate our minds with the truth, to enkindle our hearts with the fire of your love, to enable us to be faithful in conforming our lives to Christ and corresponding to the graces that you freely give to your beloved sons and daughters. I pray especially for Christendom College, for the administration, faculty, staff, and student body, for all of the alumni, that you would continue to bless and guide, empower and use them to be faithful disciples of Jesus, your son, to be fruitful apostles empowered by the Spirit. So help us and hear us as we pray the family prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. At the risk of embarrassing my son-in-law, I also wish to congratulate Christendom on the acquisition of a very fine young scholar who's getting ready to defend his doctorate at Notre Dame at the Medieval Institute, soon to be Dr. Ben Reinhardt. So, uh... Someday he may forgive me for that. <laughs> it's also the backstory of the visit. I'm on sabbatical, and I'm making it my point now to not only visit our six kids, but our eight grandkids. And so I was out in Denver last week to see four of them. And uh, little Leo Gregory, who just is about to turn seven months, is a, a big magnet that draws us here as well. Kimberly wanted me to pass along her regards to she was planning on joining me and then at the last minute had to kind of back out. 
but it really is a joy, especially because we get to focus on a theme that is so central to this year of faith, and that is the new evangelization. And we're really getting ready for the final lap of the year of faith. And it's going to leave us a lot of graces, and the legacy of the new evangelization, I think, is going to be empowered, enlarged for all of us. But I think it is important for us to get a perspective, to take a step back and look at where we are, because as they say, timing is everything. I remember the very special day when I got married, and five years later, on our anniversary, we were able to sort of... uh, share with each other the greatest anniversary gift you could possibly receive, and that was our child, Gabriel, who was born on our fifth anniversary. Then our 10th anniversary came, and we were ready to celebrate not only their anniversary, but also his fifth birthday, only we discovered that there was a terrible squabble downstairs. And when I asked what the problem was, Gabriel's older brother was telling dad, set him straight. I'm like, what's the problem? He said he is telling the whole neighborhood that he was born on the day you and mom got married. (laughs) And my five-year-old looked up, pleading, I was, wasn't I? You were born on the same date, but not the same day. But the distinction made no difference to him at all. But it reminds me that timing is everything and getting it right is as well. You recall that the year of faith began last year on October 11th, 2012, because the church was entering into the celebration of the 50th anniversary of the inauguration, the beginning of Vatican II. But it was also significant because it was the beginning of, well, the 20th anniversary of the publication of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which is arguably the key instrument for implementing Vatican II authentically. I was recently told it also happened to be the uh, time when you got your new president, Dr. Tim O'Donnell, came to christen him. Was it 1992? Yes, so uh, lots of blessings to celebrate in this year of faith. But the one purpose that we're really focusing on is the new evangelization. And again, historical perspective is important because when we look at the documents of Vatican II, we can see The theme of evangelization is emphasized in a unique way. A lot of people act as though Vatican II represents a departure from the previous tradition of the church. In fact, it doesn't take much to see that it's continuity. I remember reading the 16 documents for the very first time when I was still a Protestant minister. And I had a feminist Catholic theologian who was insisting that this was a rupture from the past, a complete novel breakthrough. And the more I read, the more clearly it became to, the more clear it became to me that this is the, this is the Catholic faith. Uh, you know, it's, it's expressed in language that might not be philosophically scholastic, biblical, pastoral. I told her, you know, it's more like a velvet-covered brick. She laughed and she said, yeah, I guess it is the same brick, isn't it? And I said, for non-Catholics, it sure feels that way. This is the faith, whether it's Vatican II or Vatican I or Trent or anything else before. But there is something that is truly unique about Vatican II when you compare it to the documents of Vatican I, because in Vatican I, the documents employ the term evangelize, or in the case, evangelium, once with reference to the fourfold gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In stark contrast, the 16 documents of Vatican II employ the Latin terms evangelizing, evangelize, evangelization a lot more. Over 100 times, over 200, 206 to be exact. And I think that is a sign that there is something that is growing out of Vatican II that we are still experiencing. Now, when Cardinal Dallas examined this, he said the key to understanding the emphasis on evangelization was, of course, the charismatic theologians who were writing in the 1950s. And don't get me wrong, men like Hoffinger and Jungmann were doing great work But I am convinced that what we really find as the interpretive key to see the continuity of Vatican II and Vatican I and Trent is to read the documents in general and especially the emphasis on evangelization in the light of the amazing pontificate of Pius XII. 
I have to avoid, strenuously resist the temptation to take a tangent early in this talk because it's only been in the last five or six years that I've discovered the amazing teachings of Pope Pius XII who produced more than 40 encyclicals in less than 20 years, which is more than all of the other popes of the 20th century combined. But it wasn't just quantity, it was quality. When you look at Divino Aflante Spiritu, Mediator Dei, Mystici Corporis Christi, and what's so interesting is that there was one man who really sees this and emphasizes, and that, of course, is our emeritus Pope Benedict, who said on the occasion of the celebration of Pius XII's legacy, of course, we all know the black legend that surrounds him concerning the Holocaust, which is a lie so big it would make Joseph Goebbels blush. And it's been falsified and refuted so many times. But it also eclipses the great legacy that we need to retrieve in order to really understand Vatican II in continuity with the church. This is what Pope Benedict wrote. It is well known that of the oral inter interventions and writings presented by the Vatican Council Fathers, over 1,000 references cite the teaching of Pius XII. Not all the documents of Vatican II have an array of notes, but in those documents that do have them, the name of Pius XII recurs more than 200 times. What does this mean? This means that with the exception of sacred scripture, this pope is the most authoritative and frequently quite cited source. He is the interpretive key. So if you're looking for subjects to write papers on in your theology classes, I would challenge you like I challenge my oldest son who's finishing his doctorate at Notre Dame in theology to lay hold of Pius XII. My oldest son did and has become my teacher because there is such wealth in his writings. I believe that this is the foundation on which the new evangelization is based. But, you know, in the middle of Vatican II, you may recall that John XXIII died and Montini replaced him and became Pope Paul VI. And when they asked him, why are you choosing the name Paul, which hadn't been used for centuries by any of the successors to Peter, he revealed that his desire was to pattern his ministry after the model of the apostle to the Gentiles, which Paul VI proceeded to enact even before Vatican II was over. By becoming the very first pope in history, to make apostolic journeys to other continents, starting with the Holy Land in India in 1964, to New York in 65, Portugal and Turkey in 66 and 67, Colombia in 68, Uganda in 69, and 1970 proved to be the banner year where he traveled and preached in Iran, East Pakistan, the Philippines, West Samoa, Australia, Indonesia, Hong Kong, and Sri Lanka. In his 70s, he was exhausted. And so instead of traveling to evangelize, he proceeded to prepare the Synod on Evangelization and a document that proved to be perhaps the most influential of all, and that was Evangelii Nunciandi, which was promulgated in 1975 with the title On Evangelization in the Modern World. So he is picking up where Vatican II left off by emphasizing evangelization, but just notice in passing that he never once employed the phrase new evangelization. But what about evangelization? The thesis statement for this papal document, he states very clearly, and I quote, evangelization is in fact the grace and vocation most proper to the church, her deepest identity. She exists in order to evangelize, to be the channel of the gift of grace, to reconcile sinners with God, and note that he adds, and to perpetuate Christ's sacrifice in the Mass, which is the memorial of his death and glorious resurrection, the Paschal Mystery. Please notice how the Pope identifies evangelization as the church's primary mission, but it's inseparable from the liturgical worship and the holy sacrifice of the Mass. It's how the mystical body inhales and then exhales and proclaims the good news. Now, of course, all of these amazing exploits that are unique to Paul VI are practically forgotten today, and no wonder, because of what John Paul went on to do. I can't begin to enumerate all of the apostolic journeys to the other continents that he took, beginning in 1978 and 79 when he took over the chair of Peter. But he put in well over a hundred apostolic journeys, clocking in very nearly a million miles. 
picking up again right where Paul VI left off in this theme of evangelization. He was the first to employ the phrase new evangelization. He did so back in June of 1979 when he returned to his homeland of Poland, to Krakow, where he was addressing a large group at Nova Huda, which had been designed by the Marxists to be a kind of worker's paradise. It turned out to be more like a nightmare for all of the factory workers and their families. It was where they were oppressed in so many ways more than just physical. And so he used the occasion of addressing the Catholic populace at Nova Huda to announce the need that the Polish Catholics have to recover their faith, to rediscover their spiritual tradition, to reconvert. And on this occasion, he called for new evangelization. It appears to be something like a throwaway line because he just mentions it in passing and doesn't develop it, and in fact, doesn't use the phrase again, not for another four years. The next time he uses the phrase is highly significant, however, because it's when he came to America. In March of 1983, when he was speaking in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, to a group of, a room filled with bishops, and he announced in 1983 that the new evangelization was going to be a high priority. It was going to be a supreme mission. And he went on to describe in 83 how we could continue the church's task of evangelizing and implement this task, this mission of the new evangelization, new in ardor, new in methods, new in expression. That's how he put it. But what he meant was anything but clear. So it was just getting started, but even back in 83, he announced that his intention was to really launch it in 1992, nine years later. People wondered, why the wait? And then he explained that 1992 would mark the 500th anniversary of what? The founding and the first evangelizing of the Americas. You go back five centuries, and what were the most populous Catholic countries in 1492 when Columbus sailed the ocean blue? They were Italy, Spain, France, and Germany. Fast forward five centuries and what are they today? In first place, Brazil, in second place, Mexico, and in third place, the United States. Countries that didn't even exist 500 years earlier are now the most populous Catholic countries on the planet, and the ones that once were are struggling to retain even a modicum of their own spiritual legacy, their Catholic identity. I think the question implicit in all of this is where will we be in 500 years or three or 400 years? And I'm not a, a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but I would say this, that the only way to answer that question is by taking blessed John Paul up on the challenge of the new evangelization. A couple of years before the official launch, he published an encyclical entitled Mission of the Redeemer, Redemptoris Missio an encyclical on the church's missionary activity. But this is where he began to clarify not only the priority of evangelization, but the uniqueness of the new evangelization. He says, and I quote, this is his thesis statement, I sense that the moment has come to commit all of the church's energies to the new evangelization. No believer in Christ, no institution of the church can avoid this supreme duty to proclaim Christ to all peoples. Notice there are no exemptions. Nobody's dispensed. Everybody is called. Everybody is to commit themselves, their time and energies to the new evangelization. So in 1992, when it got underway officially, he also made another surprise announcement by declaring his intention to hold the world, the next World Youth Day, where? In the United States of all places. And in Denver, Colorado, all of his advisors and critics agreed, bad choice. Why? Because when you look at where all of the previous World Youth Days had been held, places like Rome, Buenos Aires, Chestahova, Santiago de Compostela, these were all places with a majority Catholic population and a long tradition of Catholic pilgrimages. Whereas Denver, Colorado is situated in the middle of the country, but where young people don't know pilgrimages and where young people aren't about to gather 
to hear this aging pope tell them what to do and how to live their lives. And so, as many reporters admitted later, they arrived at Mile High Stadium and Cherry Creek Park with articles, previous written, you know, rough drafts of what they knew would happen and of how the crowds didn't show up. And then as the Pope's helicopter circled Mile High Stadium and the cameras caught how it was visibly buffeted by the forceful waves of applause and screams of over a million young people who eventually gathered to celebrate there in Denver, everybody was just subtly crumbling up their pre-written article drafts because they didn't just have a new article to draft. There was a new page in church history about to be written. And suddenly, the new evangelization became real to well over a million young people, and not just in Denver and throughout the United States, but throughout the world as well. I was just out in Denver a week and a half ago, and literally, you can count hundreds of apostolic initiatives and missionary organizations and lay projects that have grown up out of that. It's a kind of spiritual explosion. What's also interesting about that period of time back in the 90s, 1992 when it was officially begun, 1993 with the World Youth Day, I thought like a lot of people that this was the decade of the new evangelization, leading us up to the great jubilee, the year 2000, when we would enter a new century, a new millennium, and presumably a new set of priorities. But what I didn't notice, a lot of people didn't notice, and that was that John Paul described the decade of the 90s not as the decade of the new evangelization, but what, is he, what he described as the Advent season of the new evangelization. The Advent season, what does the analogy imply? Well, what is Advent? It's four Sundays leading up to Christmas. But, you know, it's just the first four Sundays in the whole liturgical year. There are still 48 Sundays left. So when we finish the decade of the 90s, guess what? The new evangelization had barely begun. This was never a short-term policy. This was always intended to be a long-term commitment that would outlast John Paul and presumably the next few successors. And if there was one man who really got it, while most of us didn't, he was then known as Cardinal Ratzinger, and then he became Pope Benedict. And he took the emphasis on the new evangelization to the very next level, you might say not only by announcing the synod that met last year in October of 2012 to bring all the bishops together to focus their, their energies on how to expand the new evangelization, but he also established a new dicastery in the Roman Curia, the Pontifical Council for Promoting the New Evangelization. All of these are like spokes in a wheel that converge on the hub, which is the task that we all share. But again, we should ask ourselves, what is the new evangelization, lest this lapse into more ecclesiastical jargon? Because I find a lot of people are talking about it without clarifying it, much less doing it. A sort of new evangelization fatigue may set in soon near the end of the year of faith. I think we have to resist that strenuously, but the best way is by clarifying what is so new about the new evangelization. As John Paul clarified, there are two priorities in the church's mission to evangelize. The first is what he calls primary evangelization, is that, that is when we proclaim the gospel to those who have never encountered Jesus before. But what he describes as secondary evangelization is precisely the new evangelization because it is, as he put it, required wherever Christians have lost a living sense of the faith and no longer consider themselves members of the church. So primary evangelization means evangelizing and then baptizing those who have been evangelized and catechized. The new evangelization requires us to evangelize the baptized and to catechize them as well. Or as Pope Benedict put it recently in Verum Domini, to re-evangelize the de-Christianized. And their name is Legion, for there are many. If the good shepherd leaves the 99 to find the one, what should our shepherds do and how can we help them when we're not looking at one and 99, we're looking at a very different set of proportions. 
We're looking at the Catholics in America forming the largest religious group, the Southern Baptist II, but actually between first and second place, the second largest group are the non-practicing Catholics, literally numbered in the tens of millions. So the new evangelization represents our marching orders, the task at hand, but not something that is going to go away anytime soon. But there's something else that is new about the new evangelization. It isn't just for clergy. It isn't just for missionaries. It isn't just for those who go out to the foreign lands. It's for each and every single one of us. Not only to go out and share the faith, but also to allow ourselves to be evangelized and converted. Because implicit in the whole project of the new evangelization is a deeper understanding of what conversion means. Conversion is not just what happened to me on the Easter Vigil of 1986 when I entered the church. It isn't just what happens to a troubled teenager when he makes a decision for Jesus or to a cradle Catholic when you were baptized. As Blessed John Paul emphasized throughout his pontifical teachings, conversion is lifelong. It's ongoing. It's ever deepening. It's daily. And it's also difficult. And so what does our Lord say? If any man would follow me, let him take up his Bible each day and fall. No, it's taking up a cross. And for that, the grace of conversion is needed. And I think a lot of you recognize the fact that in our tradition, this isn't new. Because when you study spiritual and mystical theology, you discover that there are certain ages or stages of the spiritual life. You begin with the purgative, then you move on to the unitive, to the illuminative, then you culminate in the unitive. And many of us never get to the third stage, but whoever does will experience the grace of conversion is ongoing, ever deepening, and it never gets easy. So the new evangelization is new because it engages all of us. It's also new because we're re-evangelizing the baptized. It's also new because it's deepening our appreciation for what we need in the grace of conversion. But I think it's also new because for us as Catholics, we're waking up to discover how we are to evangelize. I remember back in 1992 when the new evangelization was really getting underway, Blessed John Paul published an article in L'Observatore Romano. I remember reading it because the, the headline grabbed me. The title of the article was simply, Base the New Evangelization on the Eucharist. And I remember thinking to myself, how do you do that? That must certainly be a translator's option. You know, that, that, that can't be what he meant. And then I read it, and it was exactly what John Paul meant. Now, I hadn't been a Catholic even 10 years at that point, but I had been an evangelical for many more. So I thought I knew what it meant to evangelize. It basically means taking somebody through four simple steps, or what we call the four spiritual laws. Number one, God loves you. Number two, you've sinned. Number three, Christ died for our sin. And fourth and finally, we must choose what to do with that gift. Are we going to lay hold of this gift? Are we going to make it our own by faith? And if we do, we experience the grace of salvation, the grace of conversion. A personal relationship with Jesus is initiated. So we could take people through those four simple steps coming down for a landing. We could do it on an elevator, just three or four stories from the lobby. We could take them through those steps. When we stepped out of the lobby, we could say, why don't we pray together? And we would lead them on what we call the sinner's prayer, where you basically summarize the, the gospel as we shared it. Yes, I believe you love me, God. I know that I've sinned, but I also believe that Christ died for my sin, and so I want to believe and give my life to him as he did for me. Amen. And I mean, we could do it in the lobby, but the one thing we couldn't do is to turn around and invite that person to go down the street to the local Catholic parish and receive their first Holy Communion. How do you base evangelization on the Eucharist? That was troubling to me. Now, before I look carefully at what John Paul means by this and what our tradition does with that, I want to just take another step back and recognize the fact that there are some good reasons why certain Catholics are reluctant to just get on board with the new evangelization or resistant to the notion of evangelization. For one thing, I, I tend to see that many Catholics, especially in America, associate evangelization with 
the work of fundamentalists and other groups too who are often anti-intellectual, somewhat emotional, often manipulative, and frequently anti-Catholic as well. And there's also the problem of scandal and hypocrisy that has attended their ministries now for decades. Besides, we live in the United States where religion is a private matter and many Catholics would prefer to keep it that way. But I don't believe that's really a live option for us anymore if we wish to obey and give consent from the heart to what the Vicar of Christ has been saying. Not only Blessed John Paul and Pope Benedict, but Pope Francis, especially in the World Youth Day of last month, has taken all of this to the next level. I think also people are resisting the new evangelization because, you know, Catholics evangelizing, you know, that's not what we do. Let the evangelicals evangelize and we'll pick up where they leave off by doing apologetics. We'll take their converts and turn them into Catholics. <laughs> Been there, done that. You know, I sort of feel like the poster child of that two-stage process. And I don't think we need to begrudge the evangelicals for their evangelizing. But I think if we follow the lead of John Paul, Benedict, and Francis, it's time for us to consider cutting out the middleman, so to speak, and learning how to evangelize ourselves, sharing the faith, but also receiving the faith and the ongoing grace of conversion. Another common objection you'll sometimes hear is from those who like to invoke the words of St. Francis of Assisi, who is famously quoted as saying to his friars, preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, use words. Now these folks prefer to evangelize through the witness of their lives, as opposed to using words. And I don't want to be misunderstood. The witness of our lives is arguably the most important thing of all. Let's face it, most of you will probably never get a chance to preach a homily or give a lecture at Christendom like I am tonight, you know, or to write a book. But with our lives, we are basically proclaiming the gospel. And this is the foundational way to share it with others. But if that is used to excuse or exempt people from ever having to use words, that is itself a profound misunderstanding. The Catechism is very clear in 905. Lay people fulfill their prophetic mission by evangelization. That is the proclamation of Christ by word and the testimony of life. The witness of life is not the sole element. The true apostle is on the lookout for occasions of announcing Christ by word to unbelievers or the faithful. Close quote. But let's go back to revisit those words of St. Francis because, as you probably know, I teach down the road at Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio, where I've been for nearly a quarter of a century. And I'm surrounded by Franciscans who love St. Francis. A few of them are professional Franciscan historians, and I think they will tell you what they have told me, that you can search all the records and you will never find any proof that St. Francis ever said those words to his friars. It was a kind of medieval urban myth, I suppose, a legend. But I would also want to say this to people who put that as an excuse. You know, just look in the mirror some evening and just ask yourself, is my life so upright, so virtuous, so compelling that all people really need to do is just keep their eyes on me and my life? And that should be sufficient to give them the grace of conversion. Before you answer that question yourself, ask your spouse or your roommate. <laughs> you may be in for a surprise. The fact of the matter is, if anybody lived such a life, it was St. Francis, but he used words with just about every opportunity. And not just St. Francis, but his master and ours, our Savior and Lord. Now there was a life lived so well, so righteously, in such a holy way as to compel conversion, and yet he preached the gospel as much as anybody. But let's get back to this point. What does it mean to base the new evangelization on the Eucharist? And John Paul isn't the only one to say that. I remember listening to a paper recently by Cardinal George, the Archbishop of Chicago, and he said near the beginning of this, this talk that all evangelizers proclaim Christ, he said, but Catholic evangelizers proclaim a Eucharistic Christ. 
More recently, Archbishop Gomez out in Los Angeles emphasized this too in his own way. He said, our evangelization must be intensely Eucharistic for it to be truly Catholic. Intensely Eucharistic, how does that work if we can't take people through the four spiritual laws and then give to them Holy Communion? I think what it requires of us as Catholics who evangelize is a new way of thinking about evangelization, which is actually a very old way. This is one of those places where the new evangelization has a lot to learn from the old evangelization. Because when you go back and study how the gospel was proclaimed in the first four or five centuries, you'll recognize the kerygma. That is, the core of the gospel message consists essentially of those four truths. God loves you. You sinned, Christ died and rose, and now you must choose to believe or not. But what happened at the end of the proclamation of the kerygma was a conversion. And it made someone truly into what was called a convert. But that wasn't the end game. That was the beginning. Because having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ is not enough. It is necessary, but it is not sufficient. And so from the early church, what we learned from the old evangelization is that this was the first stage of a process. Because once you heard the gospel, once you were truly converted, once you were evangelized, the way you proved that you were serious about your decision was not simply by remaining a convert, but by becoming a catechumen, by enrolling in the catechumen, where suddenly you were hearing more of the scriptures. You were learning the Apostles' Creed and all the 12 articles. You were memorizing the Our Father, the seven petitions, and learning how to pray, learning how to fast, allowing yourself to be scrutinized for the big day, because after being evangelized, when you were catechized, that too was not the end game. That was a means to an end, and the end would come at the Easter Vigil. It might be months, it sometimes went for years, whatever it took to be evangelized and then catechized before you were sacramentalized. And then an Easter Vigil, baptism, and of course, confirmation and Holy Communion. The catechism echoes this three Pro, this three-step process in a way that I think is highly significant and instructive for us. In paragraph 1229, where we read, becoming a Christian has been accomplished as a journey in several stages in which certain essential elements have to be present. Number one, proclamation of the word, acceptance of the gospel in telling initial conversion. Number two, the profession of faith referring to the Apostles' Creed, and number three, baptism itself, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and admission to Eucharistic communion. And it goes on in 1230 to describe how Christian initiation sometimes involved a long period of the catechumenate, preparatory rites, liturgical landmarks along the way before baptism was allowed. So evangelized, catechized, and then sacramentalized. Paragraph 1617 echoes this as well, where we read, the entire Christian life bears the mark of the spousal love of Christ and the church. Already baptism, the entrance into the people of God, is a nuptial mystery. It is, so to speak, the nuptial bath which precedes the wedding feast, the Eucharist. I particularly enjoy that paragraph, that teaching, because it not only captures a basic theme that you find in all of the preaching and the catechesis and the mystagogy of the early church fathers, but it also taps into something that we all recognize from our own experience. Because evangelizing is really all about falling in love. And I can think back about 35 years when I was in love with the cutest gal at Grove City's college campus. And for the next, well, I would say for almost three weeks, I kept running into Kimberly in the cafeteria, in the mailroom, outside of her class, even in the lobby of the girls' dormitory where she said, imagine seeing you here. Well, I didn't tell her, but her roommate had given me her schedule. And so all of these were <laughs> planned coincidences. It took me that long to finally ask her out on a date. And when she agreed, we went out, and it was the first of many and I now had a personal relationship with the most beautiful woman on our college campus. But do you think that was all I wanted? No way. 
So after months of that experience, I finally got to the point where I had enough money and courage to get down on my knees there on Rainbow Bridge. The evening of January 23rd, in the lightly falling snow, I pulled out the ring and I popped the question. I like to think that sometimes in the Gospels, God gives sight to the blind, but that night he took sight from she who could see. She accepted my proposal right on the spot. <laughs> we hugged and we kissed and we danced across Rainbow Bridge, and then I took her out to Mr. Donut to celebrate. <laughs> Big spender, yeah. We had moved from falling in love to deciding to stay in love, a kind of promissory and contractual commitment. But that wasn't the end game. For months, we were engaged and we learned about each other in new ways. You know, it's a truism, but it, it's a truism because it's true that when you marry someone, you don't just marry her, you marry her whole family. And that's who I got to know in addition to falling in love with her, her siblings and her parents and, and all of the rest. And I, I know Ben Reinhardt, you can relate to this process as well. <laughs> I have no idea what it's like to get to know our family. <laughs> in any case, the great day it came, August 18th, 1979. We did more than tie a knot. We did more than to celebrate a covenant. We celebrated a sacrament which we didn't even understand for several years. But in the process of entering into that interpersonal communion, which is covenantal and sacramental, we discovered that the inner logic of love is never meant to be left off at the early stages where you're just falling in love or deciding to stay in love. You've got to grow in love. And that's a lifetime. And it's a lifelong commitment and it takes effort all the way. I know this because just several weeks ago, we were sitting on the back porch sipping wine, celebrating our 34th anniversary as we've begun our 35th year, and we were reminiscing. Because, you know, love is a lot, well, love goes through cycles, it goes through seasons. And I think if we use this analogy, we can come to see what the new evangelization entails. Because it's not just baptizing those that we've evangelized, it's also evangelizing those who have been baptized. There are a lot of people who are in love who are cohabiting, perhaps because they never were instructed about the sacrament of matrimony or the covenant of marriage or the inner logic of love as being nothing less than self-giving. Whether or not they're cohabiting in good faith, I can't decide, but I would say that many of them might be more in love than people who are married. I know people who have been married for years and yet are lonely, who are miserable, who need to be reawakened, who need to be reconverted. And as we were reflecting back on 34 years of marriage, this is what we were talking about. Because, you know, it's like the seasons of the year. When we first fell in love, it was springtime. When we got married, it was like summer. It was hot, it was fun, it was a lot of joy. And then when we got, uh, when we got, you know, our first children, when I got my first job, and then I was holding down a job and a half, it was like autumn. And then when I became a Catholic in 1986, and she didn't, it was like winter. It was long, and it was cold, and it was hard. And then in 1990, when she entered the church, it was like re-entering springtime with all of these new graces. But what we had to admit is that we went through Seasons even after she came home and be, had become a Catholic. In fact, after a couple of years, we began to discover that we had developed all kinds of bad habits. We went to a really fine Catholic marriage counselor for months. I would highly recommend it to couples who are in need because we were in need and we didn't know just how much we needed. And so he started asking questions of me alone, her alone, he'd get us together, and he'd put questions like, okay, what was the first movie you saw? What was the first song you danced to? What was the first restaurant you dined at? Besides Mr. Donut. <laughs> and what he prescribed was the perfect medicine. He said, now go back to those places. Listen to that song. Dance to that music. And when we did little things, they had lots of grace because we kind of renewed the wellsprings. And if that's true in the natural order, in relationships that are covenantal, that require a commitment that is to be made and then kept through good times and bad, 
It isn't less true in the supernatural order, but arguably more so, especially as we face the task of re-evangelizing the de-Christianized because the cause of de-Christianization has been this oppressive secularization, which doesn't just cause us to forget the faith, but it causes us to become more and more distant from those structures that make it real. And so it is that we need to recognize not only our need to be evangelized in our family life, in our marriages as well, and this will be true for you, you know, 15, 20 years from now as you graduate and you find your spouse and that sort of thing, but it's also true in the supernatural order because we are members of the bride of Christ. And I remember hearing a Catholic priest pronounce those words of consecration, and I, I realized that my very first Mass that I could have spoken those words to Kimberly on her wedding night. This is my body which is given up for you. And so marriage is one of those places where the new evangelization can be lived out, especially places where people aren't happy but can be reawakened precisely because it's more than a contract. It's, it's a covenant. It's, it's, it's more than companionship. It's a sacrament. And so it's a divine reservoir of grace that God wishes to use to really empower us not only to fall back in love, but to grow in love in ways that are truly godlike and divine. Now, this idea of basing the new evangelization on the Eucharist then shows us that Catholic evangelization is not a sprint, it's a marathon. It isn't over and done in a day, though it can be begun in a few minutes. It's something that takes place over the course of days, weeks, months, and sometimes years. And in the end, of course, it takes place over a whole lifetime where evangelizing, catechizing, and sacramentalizing are analogous to what? To courtship, to engagement, and marriage. And it's not just a one-way street, because just as married people have got to renew the wellsprings, so sacramentalized people have got to be re-evangelized. So many Catholics grow up Catholic and then just kind of wander away or get to the point where they take it all for granted. I want to come back to that and address it because of how common it is. But I also want to focus on one other thing for a few minutes about how it is we need to base the new evangelization on the Eucharist. Because I'll be honest, I wondered about that for years. Exactly what does that mean? Well, I ran into an old friend at the Pittsburgh airport one day. He didn't recognize, I didn't recognize him, but he recognized me. I think my name might have been called out over the, the PA system. He walked up, held out his hand and said, Scott Hahn, you recognize me? And I'm like, wait a minute. I know you. I'm thinking, is he, maybe he watches EWTN. Do you watch EWTN? No, no, I've never heard of that. We went to high school together. And I'm like, Chris, my goodness, I shook his hand. You know, we gave this fraternal hug. And he's like, I have been waiting for years to see you. And you know, I, I wanted to reciprocate, but I hadn't been waiting for years to see him. So I said, really, why? He said, because for years, I have been longing to find you to tell you what's happened to me because you remember way back in high school, you know, I was a, I was a Catholic and you sure weren't. And you'd sit down at the cafeteria table. We might be talking the Pittsburgh Pirates or the weather, but you'd always shift the subject, you know, the conversation. And it wasn't always so subtle, you know, to, to religion and the Bible and Jesus and the gospel. You know, you used to say things like, where in the New Testament do you find the sacrifice of the mass, huh? Remember that? I'm like, not really, but that sounds like what I would have done. He said, well, Scott, I got to tell you, I am now an evangelical Bible Christian like you. And I'm looking into his eyes thinking, okay, how do I drop the bomb? <laughs> I said, well, that's great, Chris, because I am now an evangelical Bible Catholic Christian. And his eyes and his jaw dropped. He's like, no way. Not you. you know, how can that be? I'm like, well, I don't have the time to explain. I've got to catch a flight. He said, so do I. We exchanged business cards. Within a week, we were on the phone and we were talking to each other. And again, you know, we exchanged the pleasantries, the greetings in about a minute. And he couldn't wait to kind of launch into me. In fact, he said, Scott, I want to turn the cafeteria tables around on you and ask you the question. So where in the New Testament do you find the sacrifice of the Mass? Because as you explained to me back then, the Mass is a meal, the sacrifice is Calvary. 
And I'm like, well, well, Chris, I still agree with that one important point that, that Calvary is the sacrifice. And you could hear him sigh, like, oh, phew, I thought you were really a Catholic, you know. I'm like, no, Chris, that's what Catholics and Protestants share. We all agree, we all believe that Calvary is the supreme sacrifice. But the Mass is not just a meal. And he said, where in the New Testament do you find the sacrifice of the Mass then? And I'm like, make my day. <laughs> you know? So you know, I'm in the car, I'm on the phone, I say a prayer, and I'm like, okay, first of all, now that we've identified the common ground that we share, that the, the sacrifice is at Calvary, let's look where we depart, where we diverge. Because the fact is, if you and I had been there at Calvary on Good Friday, standing with some of the devout disciples, the authorities as well, none of us would have gone home that evening and recounted our experience earlier that day in terms of a sacrifice. He's like, why not? I said, because for Jews, a sacrifice has to take place inside the temple on top of an altar with a Levitical priest presiding, whereas Jesus was crucified outside the walls, where, you know, far from the temple, where there were no altars with Levitical priests standing by ready to preside at the sacrifice. What we would have gone home and related to our family members and friends could not have been a sacrifice. What it would have been would have been a Roman execution and a rather brutal and bloody one at that. The real question for both of us to answer is this, Chris. How in the world did a Roman execution suddenly get turned into a holy sacrifice? The supreme sacrifice of all times that you and I agree is what retired all the animal offerings. How did that happen? There was a long silence, which I allowed to linger for dramatic effect. <laughs> He's like, I don't know. I, I never heard that question before. I didn't either for years until I went off and started studying more you know, in depth. And the early church fathers, they had this awareness that we lack. And they put the question to me like I just did to you. But actually, where they found the answer was by pointing back to what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, where we read, Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. I said, that's the key. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed because the early church fathers kept returning to that verse in order to find the light that illuminates an execution and transforms it into the consummation of a sacrifice. How? Because I said, Chris, the only way you can make sense out of Good Friday is by looking at it in the light of Holy Thursday. Look carefully at what he was saying and doing in the upper room with the 12 disciples the night before because what was it? He was celebrating the Passover one last time. But that's not all he was doing. He was fulfilling it as the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. But he didn't just come to celebrate it one last time by fulfilling it and then retire and do away with it. He celebrated and fulfilled it by transforming the Passover of the Old Covenant into the Passover of the New Covenant. And what was the Passover in the Old Covenant? Was it just a meal? No, it was a sacrifice. First and foremost, the meal is secondary, and even the meal is simply a sacrificial communion on the victim. And if that's true in the Old Covenant, it isn't less but more true in the New, where Jesus comes as the Lamb to lay down his life, but also to make provisions for a sacrificial communion. I said the Passover of the New Covenant is the Eucharist that he instituted, and if that's just a meal, then it's not a Passover. But if the Eucharist that he instituted is the Passover of the New Covenant, then it couldn't be just a meal. It had to be a sacrifice. And then suddenly we discover that he didn't lose his life at Calvary on Good Friday. If he'd already given it freely as an act of love on Holy Thursday, he wasn't a victim of Roman violence and injustice as much as he was the victim of divine love. I said, the only way to understand what is happening on Friday is by looking at what he was saying and doing on Holy Thursday by instituting the Eucharist, precisely as the Passover of the New Covenant, because everything was familiar to all 13 in the upper room. Jesus and the 12 were Jews. 
until he took that unleavened bread and spoke unfamiliar words saying, take, eat, this is my body, which will be given up for you. And they must have sat there wondering, what was that? You know, we never heard it before. It's not the time you just ad lib or improvise in the middle of this holy liturgy. But he was back on track, so apparently nobody interrupted or demanded some explanation until near the end of the meal, where in Luke 22, we read in verses 18 through 20 about this solemn act that Jesus performs by speaking words over the third cup, the cup of blessing, the baraka, where he says, this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the New Testament, or the blood of the new covenant. The Greek phrase kine diatheke could be translated either way. New covenant, New Testament, it's interchangeable, Chris. Synonymous. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the New Testament, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And what does he say? Do this in memory of me. Do this in memory of me. Do what? Do the Eucharist. And what is the Eucharist? The Eucharist is what Jesus calls the New Testament. In fact, the Eucharist is the only thing Jesus ever references as the New Testament because he never uses the word covenant or testament or the phrase the New Testament on any other occasion except for this one in Luke 22. In the institution narrative when he is giving them the Holy Eucharist as the Passover of the New Covenant, this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the New Testament poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins, do this in memory of me. This is the Eucharist. The Eucharist is the New Testament. Notice he didn't say, write this in memory of me. He said, do this. He didn't say, read this in memory of me. He said, do this. And the Eucharist is what they ended up doing. As he empowered them by the Spirit to become priests of the new law, After the death and resurrection, they were proclaiming the gospel, baptizing new converts, and doing this Eucharist in memory of Jesus, who had died and risen, risen from the dead. But they were doing this as the New Testament. I said, Chris, you got to realize that if you're going to follow the New Testament carefully, you'll discover that the New Testament never calls itself the New Testament. Nowhere. Not once. But it does employ the phrase in Luke 22 and 1 Corinthians 11 and in 2 Corinthians 3, 6, but never with reference to a document, always with reference to a sacrament, the Holy Eucharist, which is the only thing Jesus calls the New Testament. I said, the bottom line is this, Chris, the New Testament was a sacrament long before it ever started to become a document, according to the document. (laughs) It's like, whoa, like I know, I remember the feeling. It's like, say that again, Mufasa. (laughs) I said the New Testament was a sacrament long before it ever started to become a document according to the document. He didn't say write this. He didn't say read this. He said do this. And that's what they all did. But as a matter of historical fact, Chris, over half of the 12 never ended up contributing a single book to the collection of 27 that we now call the New Testament. But not because they were disobeying orders, but because Jesus didn't tell them to write this. He never wrote anything. He never commanded them to write anything. Don't get me wrong. I'm glad they did. But this explains why the early church wasn't sitting around waiting and wondering for months and years. What are we supposed to believe? Why won't one of you sit down and start writing some gospels or epistles? He didn't write. He didn't command them to write. He proclaimed the gospel. They went out proclaiming the gospel and celebrating the New Testament as a sacrament, not a document. And when the document was begun, it wasn't until about 15 or 20 years later. And by the end of the first century, when the New Testament documents were complete, and you find the phrase New Testament employed seven times in the New Testament, it never refers to itself. It's always pointing beyond itself. You know, it's sort of like when I go to the Pittsburgh airport, I always see this sign saying Pittsburgh airport, but next to that is the number 14. So I don't stop there and wait for my flight. I drive 14 more miles because that's what the sign is pointing to. The New Testament doesn't call itself the New Testament. It calls the Eucharist the New Testament because Jesus instituted it as such. Chris, I said, if we want to be New Testament Christians, we've got to be Eucharistic Catholics. It was like, whoa. You know, my mom always says, I go a little too far, you know. And so, 
If she's still a Baptist, pray for her. But I tell you, after about an hour, Chris was like, I, I need time to assimilate this. I'm like, I know, I did too. And so we, 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 we hung up and we got back on the phone again. One week later, he said, okay, let's go back over this ground again. What was the first thing you said? That if the mass is just a meal, yeah, Calvary is just an execution. Only if the Mass, the Eucharist that Jesus instituted, is the Passover of the New Covenant, then and only then do we see how a Roman execution suddenly gets transformed into the consummation of the sacrifice, the initiation of which occurs when the Eucharist was instituted. These two events are one. They're fused. They're mutually illuminating. You can't understand either one without the other. He wasn't just saying it. He was doing it. And then he wasn't just dying. He was giving his life. And he said, what was the other thing you said? Oh, the New Testament is a sacrament long before it started becoming a document. According to the document. He's like, yeah. Whoa, I never thought of that, but I, I hadn't either. Not until I was on this painful process of kind of opening myself up to being a real New Testament Christian. And I said, but there's one other thing I want you to notice, and, and that is this, that reflecting on what we shared last week, you know, when Jesus uses the phrase the New Testament, with reference to the Eucharist that he's instituted, by saying, this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the New Testament. Yeah, I think we find another answer to that question I used to put to you that you just put to me. Where in the New Testament do you find the sacrifice of the Mass? I said, Chris, the New Testament is the sacrifice of the Mass, according to the New Testament. The sacrifice of the Mass, when Jesus instituted it, is the only thing he ever called the New Testament. And if it's just a meal, Calvary is just an execution, but if it's the Passover the new, then we found the answer to our question. And another hour went by and he was exhausted. And I'll be honest, I was driving to St. Vincent's Seminary. I was preparing to teach a class at the seminary every Monday to these guys, it was entitled Scripture and Liturgy. And I, I would get out of the car so pumped by feeling how much God was loving this guy through me. Like, I mean, I was saying things I never heard myself say or anybody else, you know? It was like God was showing me how with a rhetorical economy of expression he could communicate a lot and a little. So I would just put away my notes, seminarians, you gotta hear what just happened last hour with this ex-Catholic and I would tell them. And it was like, oh, you know, put away your lecture notes more often. Well, for months we had these conversations, and then for like two or three months there was a lull. And once again, I suspected I pushed a little too hard. I went a little too far. And then out of the blue, one day, it was a Saturday afternoon, I got a call on my cell phone, caller ID. Oh, finally, he didn't write me off. Hello, Chris. He said, oh, Scott, good to hear from you. I'm with Carol. We're in the car. We're having a great day. Like, I can tell. What, what, why the good mood? He said, yeah, because... Just last week after we finished the Lamb's Supper, we read, Lord, have mercy. And we decided, you know, confession, reconciliation. It's like free health care. <laughs> it's just like you say, you know. He said, we're driving back from our local Catholic parish. We just got back from confession for the first time in over 30 years. I'm like, oh, my God. And you're in a good mood still? <laughs> you know? He's like, well, Carol and I are in a good mood because tomorrow morning we finally get to go back and receive Holy Communion, Christ's body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist for the first time in more than three decades. That's why we're in a good mood. And I'm like, whoa. I mean, <laughs> suddenly it occurred to me, this is the new evangelization. This is re-evangelizing the de-Christianized. In this case, the de-Catholicized. This is basing the new evangelization on the Eucharist. This isn't just evangelizing, catechizing, and sacramentalizing. And let me just add that when we start catechizing, we don't stop evangelizing. If anything, the good news gets better. And when we start sacramentalizing, and we're not catechizing and evangelizing so much, that's like the gospel on steroids. It's one thing to hear the word. It's another thing to consume the word and to have him assimilate us to his glorified body. And so we hear the new evangelization. And I want you to really avoid strenuously any temptation to new evangelization fatigue. This is not ecclesiastical jargon. This isn't just another excuse for establishing a new dicastery in the Roman curia or a new bureaucracy in the local diocese. These are our marching orders. And where our country is in 500 years, 
and in 500 months depends upon whether or not we are faithful in giving a heartfelt consent and say yes to our Lord using us. In conclusion, I want to just say this. How do we go about this? Because as I mentioned earlier, most of you will probably never give a homily. Most of you will probably never publish a book on the gospel, the new evangelization. But all of us are called, all of us are tasked with this as our commission. I am convinced that when we look at it carefully, we realize that the message and the medium correspond. They converge. What is the message? Friendship with God. That almighty God stooped down to our level and took what is ours to give us what is his. He took our human nature to make us partakers of the divine nature, to share in a filial deification of the eternal son so that not only as slaves and mere creatures, but as prodigals, as runaways, as disobedient rebel slaves, we have been loved and reconciled. And if Almighty God was not just willing, but dying on the cross to forgive us in this way, to restore friendship with us, then that is the message, but it's also the medium. Because the principal way for ordinary Catholics to evangelize is not on a street corner necessarily, but it is at the water cooler. You know, if around 10.15 a.m., you know, you're taking a coffee break and you're standing over by the coffee pot with five or six co-workers in a secular environment where you're, you know, working hard as a new employee, nobody's going to think you're weird if you turn to your co-workers and say, I just went to a concert Friday night and it was superb. Or I just saw a movie Saturday, this release, and I recommend it. Who are you to shove your theater down our throats? <laughs> They're not going to say that. You know, and so if you turn around and say, you know, I grew up Catholic, but for the longest time, I took it for granted. And recently, it's just come alive. It isn't just true. It's powerful. It's beautiful. I never saw it coming. Nobody might say a thing. But later on at lunch, you know, somebody might say, what are you doing tomorrow for lunch? It might be a month or two. But I'm convinced in the context of friendship, it is the most natural way for each and every one of us to express the message of the gospel, which is divine friendship. To do it in ways that friends do. Because that's what friends do. They share with other friends and co-workers what they've enjoyed. And so Paul VI said it so clearly that when you evangelize in the modern world, it isn't primarily didactic in action where you're just teaching. No, those who are going to evangelize in the modern world, he explained, are going to have to bear personal witness to the truth of the gospel as they have experienced it. That's what it means to bear witness. And that's why you're here, because all Catholics are involved, but very few Catholics are going to be equipped like Christendom students. Very few Catholics are ever going to be launched like Christendom grads. So let me just ask you those old questions. If you don't, who will? And if you wait, when will it happen? And if you say yes, i got to tell you, stand back and watch. Because God wants to do more through us than we want him to. And he's capable of doing far more than we have enough faith at this point to ask him to. Furthermore, I would say if we look back you know, on our history and realize what the Holy Spirit did through the fathers of the church and the martyrs and all of the, the mothers of the church as well, all of the, the unsung heroes who weren't necessarily martyred, but who bore witness in their marriages and families. You know, what did the church face in the first four or five centuries? They had to evangelize a pre-Christian culture of death. And what were the chances? Zilch. And yet, against all odds, what did God the Holy Spirit do through the Holy Catholic Church? Transform this pagan culture of death into what historians came to know as Christendom. And if God did it before, there's no reason to think he can't do it again. And I'm convinced that what he wants is simply a sincere, albeit feeble, yes, heartfelt consent. Use me in my relationships and then transform me and make me a saint by helping me to make others saints as well. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, our Father in heaven, we thank you for the good news, for the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, for the divine sonship and eternal life 
that he gives us because of what it is he assumed from us. And in his name, we pray for you to pour out the Holy Spirit upon us, upon us as individuals who are beloved children of yours, upon our families, and especially the troubled marriages that you wish to renew, and in our world, which is so tired and aging because it has turned its back on the timeless and ever youthful eternal truth of the Catholic faith. I pray for my brothers and sisters that you would enable them to lay hold of the education they're going to get here, that they've already received and will receive, that they will see their commencement really as a commission to go forth and to spread the good news. I thank you for this privilege of sharing, but I ask you for a greater privilege of receiving, along with all of my brothers and sisters, the fullness of the power of the Holy Spirit to go forth and be faithful. For this is what your eternal Son has merited, and this is what you as his loving Father long to give us. So help us and hear us as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Holy Mary, star of the new evangelization, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Real briefly, I want to just say that um, a lot of what I have shared this evening is taken from a book I just came out a few weeks ago called Consuming the Word, the New Testament and the Eucharist in the Early Church. And I, I, I got the idea to write this as sort of the sequel to the Lamb's Supper as a result of months of weekly phone conversations with my friend Chris, who's become a much better friend now that he is an evangelical Bible Catholic Christian. So I want to just encourage you to take a look at that. It's on the table out there. And uh, since I was here last, when was that, 2008? The beginning of the year of St. Paul. There are a few other books that have come out too you might be interested in. This one, uh, Kinship by Covenant, is a theology of the Bible rooted in the covenant, the family, and the trinity. And then uh, one of my all-time favorites is this one, Covenant and Communion, the Biblical Theology of Pope Benedict. I uh, I came to realize as uh, Pope Benedict's teachings were unfolding from 2005 on how much I owed this guy. And so I, I just wanted to make it a, a, an act of gratitude to write a book on his biblical theology. And in the process, I realized how much of my stuff is highly unoriginal, how I've drawn extensively from him. When I finished the manuscript, just for a good laugh, I sent it off to the largest evangelical Protestant publisher in the US. Now, I mean, knowing they'd turn it down, but you know, just wanting them to hear what they said. Jim called me back. He was the editor in chief of the whole branch. He said, I read the manuscript. We're going to publish this. I can't believe that your Pope can make the Bible come alive like very few others. <laughs> and I got a bunch of blurbs from Protestants as well as Catholics, too. I said to Jim, you know, there are a few Catholics, at least, who don't know that about their Pope as well. He's like, really? Oh, my. You know, so I want to really commend because I think in some, time, in, in some cases, we're too close to something that is truly unique and momentously important in history. And the pontificate of Blessed John Paul is just so great. I mean, who can follow up on that? And yet, it wouldn't surprise me if someday not only was Pope Benedict named a doctor of the church, but we look back on his corpus of writings and realize that he really did in the 20th century what nobody else was doing. And that is doing theology like the early church fathers, proclaiming the scriptures in a way that was transformative for so many people. I also want to mention that tomorrow I'll be up in Alexandria speaking at the Notre Dame Graduate School of Christendom College. It's just great to come back to what Dr. Burns is leading because that's, where I was, that's what I was doing back in the summer of 2000 here in Front Royal. But I'll be lecturing on this book, Politicizing the Bible, the Roots of Historical Criticism 
and the secularization of Scripture, 1300 to 1700. It isn't an easy breezy read. It took, it took me and my co-author Ben Weicker almost 10 years to, uh, in total to, to finish this thing. It's over 600 pages. It basically ends where everybody else begins. Most people think that historical criticism began with the Enlightenment in the 1700s. What we trace are the problematic moves that were made in philosophy after Aquinas and Bonaventure that really led us into deep trouble. Machiavelli, Marsilius of Padua, and other, there's chapters on this. And for those of you who want to go under the deep end, under the rope, I'd really encourage you to consider that. And also another book that came out since I was here last is just this Catholic Bible Dictionary. I was asked by an archbishop, since there hadn't been one for 50 or more years, so many Catholics are reading the Bible and then looking at words, they don't know what they mean, they check a Bible Dictionary, and it's not Catholic, it's not faithful. So these are the tools that you might find useful. But at the end of the night, I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for your time and for your attention and for your prayers this evening. May God richly and abundantly bless you all.